Welcome. Welcome to this session on Canadian Foundations and the Strategies of Philanthropy. I'm Susan Phillips, Professor and Supervisor of the Master of Philanthropy and Nonprofit Leadership at Carleton University. As we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that our host institution, Carleton University, is located on the unceded traditional territory of the Algonquin Nation. For those of you elsewhere, we encourage you to recognize the Indigenous ancestral holders of the land in your locales. As settlers, as immigrants and their descendants, and as visitors, we honor and respect the many Indigenous peoples of Canada and hope for a more just future together. Hillary Pearson's new book, From Charity to Change, presents an opportunity to think critically and creatively about foundations, about philanthropic strategies, how institutional philanthropy is changing, and what might be distinctive about philanthropy in Canada. Hillary Pearson is the former and founding president of Philanthropic Foundations Canada, a membership organization of foundations across the country. She's past chair of the Federal Advisory Committee on the Charitable Sector, a member of many boards uh, of nonprofits and advisory committees, including our own master of, uh, previously our master of philanthropy nonprofit leadership advisory council. She's also the head of a foundation, now a university chancellor uh, at Brock, has an honorary degree from Carleton that I need to, to uh, acknowledge uh, because we're delighted and named a member of the Order of Canada. In the first few pages of her book, Hillary refers to my 2018 article, which I suggested that foundations are like giraffes, that they shouldn't exist, but they do. Now that's not my original man metaphor. I acknowledge that it comes from the 1970 book by Nielsen, Big Foundations. There's also a suggestion in the book that giraffes are slow moving, which I had to check. And it turns out that giraffes, giraffes actually can run quite fast, about 60 kilometers an hour. And that frames our discussion today because foundations are also moving along at a fast pace and they're changing rapidly. So we will explore why and how these changes are occurring and what this means for philanthropy. After Hillary's discussion of her book, we'll hear from two foundation presidents on their own experience in leading strategy in quite different organizations. Liliana Parisa became president and CEO of Montreal-based McConnell Foundation, Canada's second oldest family foundation, one of our largest, in 2020. Previously, Liliana was president and executive director of Centrale Montreal. For that, she's held a, held a number of leadership roles aimed at empowering vulnerable populations in Canada and internationally, which has been widely recognized with various honors. And while the McConnell Foundation has a long history in existence, Liliana led the work of renewing and re reworking strategic directions that I hope she'll tell us about today. Then Artie Friedman is CEO of the Definity Insurance Foundation, a relative newcomer to Canada's foundation landscape, created by the demutualization of the Economic Mutual Insurance Company. And it has quickly become a leader in addressing the systemic roots and impacts of inequality. Previously, Artie led partnership investments at the Toronto, uh, the Ontario Trillium Foundation, which is a highly respected organization in our, across our country, Ontario, and has a wide range of volunteer leadership experience in the sector. And Artie brings the inside story of how a new foundation goes about creating a strategy. So Hillary, Please kick off with ideas and discussion of your book on Canada's Family Foundations, and we'll turn to Liliana and Artie. For those of you 
participating. If you have questions along the way, which we will take at the end, um, following a, a conversation among us, please put them in the question and answer. Hillary, over to you. Thank you very much, Susan, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to talk about uh, my book, but also to talk more broadly about uh, this topic of philanthropy and of foundations, uh, which is something I've been passionate about for 20 years or more. Uh, and I, uh, I relish every opportunity to talk about uh, the world of foundations in Canada and uh, elsewhere as well. But, you know, I actually, I want to begin with what is actually the end of the story. Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, what are foundations for? What is it that foundations do? It's not so much about foundations themselves as about the outcomes of, of the work that foundations engage in. And I think it's fair to say that we live in a country that is better than it was 20 years ago. Um, you know, even if the news headlines uh, suggest otherwise. Um, and here are some examples of, of how it is better. Adolescents and young adults across the country um, can now get access to integrated youth services for early help with mental health challenges. Uh, the parents of disabled young people can build financial and emotional security for them after their parents are gone. Four-year-olds are getting early learning opportunities in pre-kindergarten uh, that will set them up for school success. Poverty reduction strategies in cities across the country are making lives measurably better. And in every one of those examples, a grant-making foundation has provided the, the seed funds, the connections, the training, or the advocacy support to make it happen. So why don't we know this? <laughs> why don't we know more about this? And one answer might be that foundations don't make themselves better known. And you mentioned the giraffe uh, uh, metaphor, Susan. You know, and I, I've really thought a lot about that image. Uh, it, there is a mystique um, about foundations. Uh, and I'm not sure that it is deserved or in fact that it's desirable. Uh, and when I wrote the book, I, I used that, I referred to that, um, that image, that metaphor, um, and I, I posed a different uh, similarity, a different uh, type of metaphor. I suggested that foundations could be thought of more like dolphins, uh, so curiosity and communication and collaboration and uh, quick, quick moving creatures. So are foundations like dolphins? You know, this isn't what most people think about. So the book is really to dispel the, the myths uh, about foundations and, and to tell their stories. You know, over the last 20 years, there's been a lot of change in the foundation world, um, in Canada and elsewhere. Uh, you know, more wealth, so more people creating foundations. Uh, global disruption, whether it's a pandemic or it's a war or it's uh, the movement of people, you know, tremendous amount of change in the world. New digital networks, new personal connections that are, are fostered by digital networks, that's made a, a huge difference in building community and building community uh, for foundations too. And a lot of internal change. So new staff coming into foundations, a lot of learning, a lot of structured learning. And so all of that has changed the way in which uh, foundations behave. And I think all of that in itself is an interesting story uh, to tell. Uh, but I should say, it's not a story that's being told or that I could tell into a vacuum. In other words, I'm, I'm uh, dealing with a story that exists out there about what foundations are. Sometimes it's a benign story. So, you know, foundations exist to help those in need. Uh, sometimes it's a, a conspiratorial story. You know, foundations are anti-democratic vehicles for the wealthy. Uh, sometimes it's a critical story. You know, foundations sequester urgently needed resources for today's problems. Uh, it's, you know, it could be an aspirational story too. Uh, foundations are the risk capital for much needed social innovation. So, you know, a lot of positive uh, to that story. Is there a single story? 
Probably not. Uh, you know, philanthropic foundations are as different as the, the sources and the uses of their capital. But to me, the compelling question is, do they matter? Do foundations matter? Is there a convincing story to tell about that? You know, and at, at its most basic, the foundation story is, yes, about charity, about caring for others. Uh, but, you know, in 2022, community needs are, are greater than ever. And the importance of equity as, as well as compassion is changing philanthropic priorities. So is the story only about charity or is it also about change? And of course I called my book From Charity to Change. And I write in the book about how the story is evolving away from foundations simply as charitable givers. You know, in the early 2000s, we thought the story was uh, about foundations as investors. So the, this idea that foundations with unrestricted funds and higher risk tolerance could play an important role as angel investors in the nonprofit sector. So like early stage business investors, they could take on risk and fund the development of good ideas and models for social change by supporting experiments and demonstration pilots. But the angel investor model doesn't really work in philanthropy. Uh, it doesn't capture how social change is made. And governments aren't always there to take over the job and, and provide the exit strategy that angel investors need, typically. So another story that people told about foundations, and this was popular in the early 2000s, was about the strategic, so-called strategic foundation. So sometimes they call that the philanthrocapitalist foundation. Uh, strategic foundations are interested in bringing about social change using models and theories uh, to determine and measure specific social outcomes and impacts. So it's quite rigorous. And this story uh, suggested that foundations like businesses could be data-driven and efficient. But you know, as, as with the idea of the social investor, the story was about the solo foundation in charge. So even if it was appealing for a foundation to run its own show, this didn't open the door to more collaboration. Um, and it didn't consider, in my view, the complexities of social change. An updated story about foundations would go differently. Um, this would be the story of the trusted partner or collaborator in which a foundation works hand in hand with community partners to achieve goals that are, are mutually agreed. I think in this more inclusive story, foundations uh, play a role together with others in making change which brings about a more socially just community. But you know, even in that story, questions of power and inequality linger. You know, foundations are privileged. Their endowments give them power. The, many would argue that the power is unfairly earned or used. Lack of transparency, closely held governance, uh, conditional granting, those all are things that give more weight to this description of foundations as vehicles for charity, but not contributors to the changes that make charity less necessary. So I admit that, you know, having said all this, that generalizations don't make for good stories and foundations need to create better stories through their actions, not through their words. So these kinds of stories need details to stick in the mind. And my book, in my book, I, uh, I use such details to tell the stories of 20 Canadian foundations. And I chose these foundations um, to describe them, to, I chose to describe them by their actions. Uh, they're field makers, they're community capacity builders, they're power shifters, they're conveners, they're connectors. Notice that I'm not talking about grant makers. I mean, grant making is a tool, it's a means to an end, but these are roles that these foundations are playing in the areas that they've chosen to work in. The 20 foundations represent themselves, uh, not anyone else. And you know, they can't be pigeonholed as investors or strategists or innovators. I mean, it might be all three in fact, um, but no one story was gonna fit them all. Uh, I think their individual stories contribute to the portrait that answers that question, why do foundations matter? And I chose to write about foundations that are, are generally independent, uh, run by autonomous boards. So whether connected through family or not actually. So not all family foundations. I didn't focus on public foundations, uh, which fundraise uh, for their institutions or for their communities. Although of course they do excellent work. Uh, I, wanted to write about these independent foundations 
um, and also foundations that have been around for at least 20 years or longer and, and whose work has evolved uh, over a period of time because it does provide a track record of change and, and a way of, of seeing how foundations can change their strategies and, and can get better at what they're doing. And, and I also wrote about, I chose to write about foundations uh, who already communicate the importance, uh, sorry, who understand the importance of communicating what they do. I needed to, to have examples of foundations that are out there already explaining uh, what their strategies are and how they go about doing what they're doing. You know, it could be said, I guess, that I chose only the most positive stories, um, but, you know, I'm not uncritical in the book. Um, I note that foundations in Canada are being called out, um, as they are in the United States and elsewhere, um, for not moving quickly in a world of rapid climate change and increasing uh, inequality. That goes back to this uh, giraffe dolphin comparison, you know, foundations that have to move a little faster uh, than many of them do in, in all their processes and strategies. And foundations, just like other organizations, do need to focus more on equity and inclusion. And they need to be more transparent. That means sharing data more proactively, not only because the regulators ask for it, but because it's important to uh, the, the partners that foundations are working with. And I think to show themselves accountable, foundations need to explain what change, what social impact they seek and how they're going about it. So the foundation leaders that I interviewed, uh, I think by and large know this. Many others who I didn't include directly in the book, but to whom I've spoken, uh, know it too. Younger generations of families on boards of, of foundations, new leaders like Artie of uh, recently created foundations, uh, new donors in the field are, are responding in 2022 with very creative strategies for deploying capital for public good. And I think a book written five years from now might well include them. In fact, I hope it does. I may even write a second edition of this book, you know, and include some of these stories because I, I think there's fascinating stuff happening. You know, and I, I think as I, I'm sort of going to conclude here, uh, as I think about the common characteristics of the, the foundations that uh, I write about, it seems to me that while they may vary in their missions and their roles, and they do, uh, they share certain qualities. And I guess I've, uh, you know, for alliterative purposes and to so that people remember, uh, I've captured them uh, under three C's, first one being courage. I think the leaders of these foundations, and that's whether they're board or staff, and in many cases, it's both. You need to have board and staff leadership aligned, um, but they have to be courageous. They need to have a sustained focus and, and a willingness to try different strategies. Uh, and, and a lot of these strategies would be things that hadn't been tried before. You know, the, the uh, example of uh, social investment and what people, what foundations are doing with their portfolios would be an example of how certain foundations and many of the ones I've written about de demonstrate this courage to try different things. The second C is curiosity. And that is so clear in all of these foundations uh, that they have an openness to learning, that they want to learn from their grantees, they want to learn from their partners, they, they want to learn from their peers, uh, they want to learn from the community. They've got to be curious. So courage, curiosity, and then commitment. And that's a commitment to staying the course, to being there for the long haul, to sustaining uh, the support that they give. Also a commitment to being accountable. And that can be through evaluations, it can be through the storytelling, uh, data sharing, uh, diversification and governance. You know, there's, there's got to be that strong commitment. So courage, curiosity, commitment. I saw that in every one of the foundations I wrote about. And I think these are the foundations that have the most impact, uh, social impact. Uh, and who uh, those are the ones who have made that measurable difference to Canada. So to conclude, um, I did want to show that many Canadian foundations are far from being giraffes. Uh, they're much closer to dolphins. They're run by serious people who have humility about their roles, curiosity about their communities, who are willing to, to change course and to, to learn from their actions, who are committed to working and sharing with others. And what I hope is that by giving some depth to the, to the story of what they do, that I've also shown why foundations matter 
and why we should care. So now I'll turn it over to my colleagues, Liliana and Artie, who, will, who are both examples of what I've been talking about, courage, curiosity, and commitment. Um, and they can tell you about how they've demonstrated that uh, in the strategies that their foundations are following. Thanks. Thank you, Hillary. Well, Liliana, you certainly demonstrated courage taking on the leadership of one of Canada's oldest and, and, and largest foundations. And I think it's really important to acknowledge too that being based in Montreal, that that which is a hub of many foundations, and, and I'm curious about the fact that that the the connections, the communication, the collaboration in Montreal, where there are established um, foundations, might be quite different than, than elsewhere. And I, I know you've been a leader in that. So, Liliana, your reflections. Merci. Bonjour à tout le monde. Je me trouve présentement dans la région de Charlevoix, qui est au confin des territoires Innu et euh, huron wandak donc je voudrais reconnaître euh, ce territoire sur lequel je me trouve. Don't worry, I won't be speaking in French all the time, but you did uh, mention this Montreal connection, so I, I do have to speak in my uh, mother tongue, and I want to make sure that you understand that English is not my first language, so I thank you in advance for your indulgence. And I did put a picture of the St. Lawrence River, which is right in front of my home right now, uh, so for the dolphin, uh, that is in the cold water right now. So just wanted to, to, <laughs> to say hi to Hillary from that. So, um, you know, how did McConnell work on this shifting of the strategy? Um, when I came in full time January 2021, so two years ago, um, I, I always ask my colleagues and, and, and the board members and everybody I meet, what is the role of philanthropy, one? And two, is our work relevant, current, coherent? So um, I need to recognize that the work that had started in the strategic review at McConnell started in 2018. So I do want to salute the work of uh, Tim Draymond, Stephen Huddard, and all the uh, previous generation who all retired, all in a bunch, you know, all of them <laughs> decided to take retirement at, at the same time. And that work was slowed down by the pandemic. So when I arrived, my objective was to land this exercise in the best possible way. It was, you know, maybe done at 30%. So as you know, and as uh, Hillary has mentioned in her book, um, social innovation had been at the core of the work of McConnell for almost 15 years, uh, building the field, supporting the networks, the ecosystem, strengthening the capacity of the sector, uh, with the applied dissemination approach that Tim Broadhead had, you know, brought together with the social innovation generation. And just to say that I've read the book of Hillary, it's on page 62 that she mentions this. So uh, you can go to page 62, you will see a reference about that. So the big question uh, that we asked ourselves was, was that still what Turtle Idol needed from McConnell? And if not, what should be its focus? So social innovation is an approach, a methodology, a bunch of tools to address issues differently. But I believe, and I, I do hope that the two Tims uh, will not contradict me on this one, uh, it is now more integrated within our sector and therefore everybody owns it. And therefore that's why we, we, we question, you know, uh, our role within this ecosystem. So, we also decided to revisit our posture because revisiting a strategy is one thing, but revisiting our posture is also important. We did that in 2021. We begin to shift away from initiatives to focus areas. So in the last 10 years, we organize our funding and partnerships and strategies around domains and initiatives such as food, uh, cities, cities for people, post-secondary education with recode, uh, sometimes we created these initiatives, we incubated them, or we led them. And the board agreed that we should move away from the operating foundation model uh, to be more in service and support to the sector. Therefore, to listen more, to shift power decisions within communities, as we do believe that they know better. And, and that was very much influenced by 
the indigenous partners that McConnell has been supporting for almost 20 years. And now we are targeting our efforts on what we believe are the most pressing issues uh, we face. And those issues are all interconnected and intertwined. Another element that came up from my various conversations with stakeholders was that there was kind of a lack of clarity on our purpose, our mission, our vision, and our role. And so we needed to revisit all of those elements. And we kind of validated that, yes, we're funders, so we don't um, uh, describe ourselves as grant makers, but funders, investors, conveners. We are also there to uplift organizational growth and development. We're there to support public policy engagement, and we're a strategic uh, learning partner. We also revisited our values and principles. So, you know, the, what I call the fundamentals. And we also took the time to review the various commitments that we made throughout the years. And that speaks about how we show up, you know. We signed up so many things like an um, engagement du collectif des fondations sur les égalités sociales. We're signatory of the Declaration of Action and we're members of the circle. We were the first signatory for the international philanthropic commitment on climate change. So we needed to, to, you know, to be transparent about that and be accountable. And we also needed to see how we show up when it comes to our own ways of working. And we tried to put ourselves, and since I was on the, in those shoes before, in the shoes of partners and trying to diminish the burden that they go through when they, you know, they're applicant for, uh, through a, a process, uh, a proposal process. Be more accessible, uh, opening office hours so that you can talk to someone to check, you know, is my proposal or my idea aligning with what you want to do? And, and do also explaining, communicate, doing webinars, sending newsletter, making sure that what we're shifting is, is communicated in an accessible way so, and, and, and this understandable one. So one of the things that attracted me to join the foundation, I was extremely happy in my previous position at Centre du Grand Montréal, was the Champ des Possibles. All the potential in leveraging all the various tools at the disposition of the organization. Not only its capacity to influence or to financially support, but also it's put the endowment to work. So how did we go about it? Well, for this philanthropic envelope of it, you know, we had to put some more structure. So we stroke a staff board committee, uh, what we call the strategic direction committee that met, you know, for three months on a very, very regular basis to land the work that had started in 2018, taking into account the spaces where McConnell had already been involved in the past, trying to fill the gap in the philanthropic sector. And that's why and where we landed on climate reconciliation in community. And we also clarified our intentions in Montreal because we do have a specific different approach in our home city. And those decisions were mostly taken following, taken after done so many consultation conversation and, and, and also the internal assessment. Um, after that, we looked at our, the strategic impacts within those three focus areas, wanting to make sure to clarify what it is we can do specifically within that, those broad, broad ranges. And for example, for the community one, which you know, we concluded just last fall, we surveyed the sector, we consulted with partners to understand what communities need, and, we were, and where we should focus our efforts. We followed their guidance, and now we aim to mostly fund groups that are led by community members, equity deserving groups. And from our landscape and analysis, we identified two gaps in funding, which are supporting collaboration networks, movement building and collective action. And the second one being supporting uh, policy change. So that's for the philanthropic envelope. For its endowment, we also created, you know, a, a committee, a, our investment strategy committee that was composed of um, external members of our, inter our investment committee, board members and staff. And doing that, we indirectly addressed the question about, are we going to do status quo 
So status quo for McConnell, 20% of our endowment is currently in impact investment. Should we spend down or should we go all in in impact? And uh, we looked at the landscape. We did a lot of benchmark, looked at other foundations, and we looked at the market, the financial market. What was the readiness uh, level there? So one of our values is gener generational thinking. And as part of our commitment to truth and reconciliation, we are committed to operate in alignment with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and be responsible to future generations. And this aligns as well with the principle of the seventh generation in which the decisions we make today must be sustainable for this generation and the seven generations to come. So that's why we shared last week in our newsletter, our new investment strategy and our intention to be 100% impact in about five years, market permitting. We made also our commitment to net zero carbon emission by 2050 at the latest. Uh, with interim reduction targets of 36% by 2025 and 60% by 2030, and include the integration of equity, diversity, inclusion, accessibility consideration throughout our investment process and due diligence. So this is how we develop and advance our strategies and work, reaching out, listening, consulting, validating, putting some structure in the process with board committees, and making sure that we communicate in an accessible language. What a remarkable and, and, and exciting transformation. Artie, like Liliana, you came to your leadership role at a time when the uh, indigenous and, and racial justice movement were, were much more on, on the radar and, and central than they had been for some time. COVID had pulled back the curtain on the inequities existing. And you had the opportunity, have the opportunity to build a strategy from the ground up. Can you tell us how you, how you led that, what you learned, and, and what might have been some of the challenges? Great. Thanks so much, Susan. And um, hi, everyone. I, I just want to say I'm calling from Toronto, which is the traditional territories of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, Chippewa, Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and many of whom still live and work here today. You know, Susan, you touch on an incredible point. It's not every day that you get to start a new foundation with a blank sheet. And, and, and it was truly, truly a privilege and one that, you know, I don't hold lightly, especially as you mentioned, um, you know, the moment in time in which we came into the space, um, we were created in the midst of a viral pandemic, the likes of which we've not seen since 1918 followed by economic disasters, the likes which we haven't seen since the 1930s, and then the worldwide protests against racism, which we haven't seen since the 60s. So it was at this trifecta where the foundation was, um, was born. And, you know, I came into the space with humility. There were so many before us. Um, and we wanted to be really thoughtful, not only about what we fund, but how we show up in the space. So for us, it was really important to build institutions, systems, processes that are responsive and relevant to the people we were serving. And um, uh, you know, we really needed to understand our own core beliefs um, of what we believe as a philanthropic organization. It's you know, it's really easy to give away money. You just start up shop. You don't have to do anything. You just give away money. As, and as Hillary mentioned, though, philanthropic organizations grant making is a tool. Like that's not the end on it all and be all. So who were we? What do we believe about being philanthropic organizations? And if we really wanted to address equity, we knew we needed to shift our mindsets from a framework that grounds giving in charity to a framework that grounds giving in justice. And um, especially given, you know, our, our, our mandate of um, really wanting to address the root causes of inequalities related to health, socioeconomic, and, um, and climate-related challenges. So, you know, a justice framework uh, recognizes and acknowledges the realities that force communities into oppressive situations, whereas 
A charity model looks at people and places that have suffered injustice as things to be solved, right? Where justice changes the polarity. It centers power with those that need to be in power and brings in equity and justice. And our values of community integrity and justice really, really guided us. I think, you know, you mentioned that we had started through the demutualization and, and, and that's true and economical um, at that time, early on, you know, there was an article that uh, the philanthropist had wrote about the birth of the foundation. It was really interesting because it started in the 1800s in um, what was then Berlin, it's now Kitchener. And the whole intent was neighbor helping neighbor to fight the injustices that came through far, through like di different things that happened and, and recognizing the solutions came from community, having the integrity to work together to address um, justice. And our research showed that race has been such a defining factor when looking at organizations, um, uh, which organizations get funded, how much they receive, the biggest factors, you know, holding back philanthropy's efforts to advance social change is really rooted um, in race. And at the same time, we knew that Black, Indigenous, racialized people in Canada, especially the intersections of women and youth, um, face this disproportionate impact to health, climate, social, uh, economic challenges. So, so we really need to, uh, we really needed to think through, um, you know, think through our core beliefs. And I mentioned that because the process of creating a strategy, you know, as Eliana mentioned, doing the consultations, really trying to understand your values, your, your principles, et cetera. We do the same things, but I think being able to understand who you are, who we are and our core beliefs is where we wanted to start, especially when you're starting from a blank sheet. So, you know, one of the, um, our core beliefs uh, that we had landed on based on, we did uh, consultations with 60 sector leaders and I have to thank Hillary and McConnell as well. They were part of her consultation process. There were many that went before us. Many have learned so much. We wanted to learn from what they were learning and what they were hearing and, and, and our core beliefs, you know, were that, it, you know, it, we're only tinkering at the edges if we're not focused on the roots and impacts of inequality. So if you're just addressing inequality at surface levels, you're not really going to be able to address inequality. You really have to go deep, go down, get to the roots of impacts and inequality. And that helped us build a strategy um, of, of what we would fund. Then the other you know, belief we had was about engaged philanthropy, that we need to maintain close, respectful, and active relationships with partners and grantees. So we knew that early on. This was the kind of fund that we wanted to be. We wanted to be engaged. We wanted to come to the table as a partner. We wanted to know people's aspirations and goals. We didn't want them to say yes to a strategy. We wanted to, to really understand what their goals were and is there something that we shared? Is there alignment that we can both work towards? Um, flexible funding. So, you know, we recognize that offering flexible funding allows for learning, it allows for adjusting, it uh, keeps us relevant. Um, planning, it, it makes planning possible, allows for longer term year funding as well. And then maximizing resources. So again, our strategy is unique in that we want to work collaboratively with like-minded foundations and 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 really tackle intractable problems that require requires to bring all our resources to bear. Um, the best solutions come from the community. So early on, we we know we recognize that the brilliance and ingenuity required for change exists within community. And again, that's important to our strategy. And then continuous learning that we must learn, you know, really intentionally by listening and courageously doing, not being able to, to not being afraid to adapt rather and taking risks, innovating, as Hillary mentioned, testing you and different approaches. So those are some of the things that um, that we, we wanted to look at. So we did develop a strategy. We have like outcomes areas. We've got our, our core principles uh, based on those beliefs. We've got our populations based on who's most underserved, based on how we actually get to the root causes. But I do want to offer um, a few things that, uh, you know, that uh, key learnings that helped shape their strategy. 
And, uh, and I mentioned some of that, uh, the beliefs early on about not tinkering at the edges, but we need to collectively work with partners, pool resources together with other funders, support community and funder collectives that ensure that funds, decisions, capacity are in the hands of the most impacted and those facing um, inequities, right? We know we, we started broad, 11 strategies is huge. You ask any philanthropic organization, that is huge. But we intentionally do it. We're, we're, we're paying to learn. We want to learn. We're, we're new in the field. Our whole mantra is let's learn. Let's take the time over the next three years to really figure out where, where we're having the most traction, what are the most impa impactful ways to really get to the root causes, and then narrow down um, when the time comes. We want to be a good partner by taking a relational approach, gain a deeper understanding of the work, reduce power and balance. And, you know, as Hillary mentioned, it's hard to do that. And, and I think, you know, being at the table, you may always have some, some of that, but there are things we can do. Like we can invert the burden, take up less time um, of people, have honest conversations, be willing to learn and support the work together and offer to add value beyond the grant. Um, evaluate to learn is another big thing for us. So we're starting to build out our evaluation framework and how we how we work with partners. And we want to support partner learning and be open to adjustments based on results. So in other words, focus on learning to generate information and insights that leads to improvement rather than staying focused and measuring metrics. So we need to shift the focus from tracking one-off grant results and take into account a more realistic view of how change happens um, so that we can support partner-led learning. And so this is, this is important, not just in for our partners, but for us as a foundation. So we just started and we already sent out our first grantee survey because we're thinking, okay, where can we learn? Where can we pivot? How can we remain nimble? And then the last thing, and this is the part I loved about Hillary's book about philanthropic organizations being field makers, community capacity builders, conveners, et cetera, is we want to aspire to bring all the foundation's resources to bear. So not just grants, right? Grants is one thing, but also our people, our influence, our ability to convene, to commission research, to amplify the issues our partners are facing or, or the voices of our partners um, and uh, true responsible and impact investing as well. The latter, we still need a lot to learn from. So I'll be calling on McCoddle as well, really good leaders uh, in that space. But, you know, happy to chat more. I, again, happy to share the strategy at some point. But, I, I, but for me, these are the key pieces and ways in which you can really come up with a good strategy, whatever it is, know who you are, and be able to advance that in a thoughtful way. Thank you. What an insightful contribution. Then that leads into a point that, that Hillary raises in the book about field building. And we know from research in Europe and, and the US that, for example, in the fair trade movement, that the, the, that the, the demand for fair trade products was in part built by foundations that funded social movement organized, civil society organizations to be advocates, to uh, do research, to be part of the field. The same was true in, uh, of the women's movement. Do we do enough field building? How, how do you see field building uh, changing in Canada? And, how do, and should we ask foundations to be doing more of this and how might they approach it? So, you know, I, this is a conversation that we could have for at least another hour, I think. Uh, but uh, the way I defined field building in the book, and maybe I'll just uh, read that uh, so that people are clear about what we're talking about. It's, it's bringing together uh, various unconnected players to create more organized activity around an issue or a set of issues. It doesn't really matter what the issue is, the, but the idea is to sort of create a field and, and, you know, some examples of social change oriented fields that have been built with philanthropic support. And you talk about this, Susan, a bit, uh, public health, justice reform, social finance, social entrepreneurship, uh, climate adaptation and career development. So in the book, I talk about uh, under the heading of building fields, I guess I talk about the McConnell Foundation very much, uh, uh, which has built 
uh, the social innovation field in Canada. Again, by bringing unconnected players together around a set of issues uh, to make one plus one equal more than two. I also talk about the Inspirit Foundation, which is a new, newer foundation. It's been around um, at least 20 years, but they're doing a lot of work now to build the field of, of narrative uh, and using narrative as a tool to uh, counteract uh, Islamophobia. You know, narrative build, uh, narrative is, is a field, uh, you know, it's a, it's a technique, but it's also a field to, and uh, philanthropy can do a lot to build uh, that kind of uh, technique. Uh, very few foundations in Canada have been doing it up to now. I think this is a real breakthrough, and it, it's going to be very interesting to see how that field develops. The McConnell Foundation's work in social innovation has been uh, well documented. It, you know, it, it took it was a good ten to fifteen years of work, uh, and it built uh, scholars, students, uh, built, you know, resource materials, understanding of what uh, the concepts of social innovation are. Uh, you know, again bringing a group of players together who have been unconnected before to uh, to focus on a an issue or a set of issues. I, I think that's a crucial role that foundations play. And it connects to what Artie was mentioning, uh, the, the no notion that foundations can be conveners. Uh, allowing for the power differential, always there and should be acknowledged. Uh, but I think that, convene, that foundations can be more neutral in many ways than than other kinds of conveners. And they have the ability to work across a number of different sectors um, to build a field. So there are many other examples, but and I think this is a very crucial uh, role that foundations should be playing in Canada and are playing. And perhaps more than, and perhaps in addition to bringing together, giving those organizations the, the encouragement, the, the capacity to be advocates for change. Absolutely. So Lillian and, and, and Artie, do you, you've both been involved in field raising, what, field building, what, what do you see as some of the changes, the developments, the challenges? Artie, do you, you want, want to go first? Go ahead. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, thanks again for, for the question, Susan. I think, you know, for, I think, um, well, one of the things I think we have to recognize is the change in the face of philanthropy over the last 10 years alone. Like, if you look at um, philanthropic organizations, many now, like, well, I'll say many loosely, but many more are led by Black or Indigenous or people of color. And I think even that field alone, Right, I think when thinking about the trend, thinking about um, when we think of community, making decisions with and for community, you know, that's all part of um, of uh, of being able to build field, signaling intention through action, demonstrating willingness to do things differently. And and one of the things, you, you, sorry, I was going to go to my third point and then I went ahead, so I'll go to my third point and then go ahead. And the and the third thing is really taking risks. You know, um, when you're building fields, you know, sometimes things are not going to be successful and you, you and, and that and that's fine. We have to be comfortable with that. Um, sometimes we need out of the box ideas to push the envelope further. I mean, when the whole notion and Hillary mentioned, you know, the field building of social innovation, social finance, McConnell, what were leaders in, in a lot of that at that time, those concepts were really new and, and a lot of people were you know, taken aback by some of that. And, and some people might have called it irresponsible or like, how can you build something or fund like a social innovation? You don't actually know if it's going to work. Yeah, you don't know it's going to work. That's the whole point of it, right? And so I think um, I think we need to be, I, I think we need to, again, we need to know, um, I think we need to be open in terms of bringing in diverse people, diverse people, uh, you know, voices being more transparent and be able to do it in a way that um, is inviting, that's inclusive, but that where you're building upon each other, it's almost like layers. If you're going to build a field, if one person talks about, let's just say like social innovation, many more came and that's how the field starts. Getting, it's like layering 
a cake, right? Until you get like somewhere that you weren't there before. It's future possibilities that don't exist yet, but they will exist as a result of convening these people together to talk about certain issues and build upon concepts and cross-pollinate ideas. As I already said it so well, I think the unusual suspects uh, at the table is a, a, an essential ingredient. Why do you build a field? Because you want to change something, you know, so it's, it's connected to system change. And when you're talking about systemic changes, there are so many factors that are connected to, to that. Uh, might it be making sure that the, the leaders or, or, or the people at the table have the capacity, have the time, have the resources to, to participate fully? That's an important point uh, to make sure that, uh, that you know, is, is it around a policy change? Very often, you know, we want to change the field or make the field evolve, but in the end result, you have to change policies to make that evolution sustainable. So it's often about policy change, and that's why McConnell decided that we would be supporting policy change initiatives, you know, at the municipal, the provincial, the federal level, because that's when we see, uh, you know, things that happen in, the, in, in, in a durable, sustainable way. And, and the, the other thing I'd say about field building is that it can be at a, a small scale and a big scale. You know, we talk about social innovation and McConnell, but they're at, at a local level, at a place-based level, there can be a lot of field building as well. And I'm thinking of the Collective Impact Project in Montreal, which brought together, you know, the city, the uh, public health system, the foundation, the community organization, everybody got to the table to change the field within, you know, the uh, a very specific territory. And that's also uh, field, change, field building and system change. Related to that, and, and Hillary, you, you raised this in, in part in the way in the context of angel investing, or the, the analogy to angel investing, but it goes directly to policy change. Where are governments in all of this? In the sense, do they play a big enough role in working with foundations where a foundation might have blueprinted an idea, taken the risk of doing some of the research, doing doing some of the building, with, with the potential then of we say handing it off, but working more collaboratively or, or closely with governments. Are governments doing enough at all levels to engage with institutional philanthropy in this country and what could they be doing more effectively? Yeah, another big question, Susan. <laughs> uh, and, and I have to say on this one, I'm disappointed. Uh, you know, I, I don't feel that governments uh, have for, for various reasons, uh, they don't appreciate uh, the role that foundations can play in supporting uh, creative policy development. Uh, they they have accountability frameworks and structures that that focus them on the short term and that make it difficult for them to align with uh, with foundations and the kinds of things that uh, the cultures of foundations. There are very big cultural differences, of course, between philanthropies and governments. Uh, you know, an example of a, a misalignment uh, would be uh, the the failure of the Chagnon Foundation and the Quebec, the government of Quebec, to succeed in the uh, the very ambitious project that they set themselves. Ten years, four hundred million dollars. Uh, I write about this in the book. Uh, you know, trying to make a, a significant difference to the lives of young children and families in Quebec. Uh, it, a laudable goal, still very important, uh, but it ran into a number of difficulties and a lot of it had to do with the misalignment of, again, accountability frameworks, time horizons, uh, and, and the different roles that are played. Governments are democratically elected, uh, at least, uh, you know, that is what we would like to believe. Foundations are not. Uh, I, they they come to the table with different sources of power and different uh, different ways of of uh, connecting to community, and that's not a bad thing. Uh, but I, I do think that it poses some difficulties in terms of you know working on uh, collaborative projects together. Now, one example that has been successful is I think uh, in the in the area of climate 
uh, climate change. I think there's some significant things that are happening that where foundations at both the federal and the municipal level are, are working very effectively. The Trottier Foundation in Montreal is working closely with the city of Montreal to help uh, map out uh, the path to net zero. You know, the city of Montreal needed that support. Uh, the foundation is able to bring people to the table. They're able to provide resources to help map a strategy for net zero. You know, that's a significant contribution. The city was open to that, willing to have that collaboration. Uh, you know, another example would be a policy change at the federal level. The Ivy Foundation has been critical there, uh, behind the scenes, but, you know, working with different policymakers, bringing the ideas forward, helping to, again, uh, in the commitment to net zero, working on pathways uh, towards that, and also the economic transition. The, the so-called just transitions, you know, that we all want to uh, see come about. Uh, Ivy has been very important behind the scenes in, in doing a lot of the work there to support policy development. So I think it's possible. It's just that, you know, broadly speaking, you know, governments, uh, it, it, it takes a lot to get government focused on work that a foundation might be doing. And, uh, you know, social innovation might be an area and social finance might be an area where we could say it hasn't been working all that well. Uh, I'd like to see it work better. Artie or Liliana, do you want to do you want to add anything to that? No, I actually have a question on that because you know sure. I'm curious, Hillary, in your research, if I may, like yes. isn't that a shift though? Because foundations never took on that role. And isn't it just in recent years that foundations have started taking on that role more, like trying to advocate with governments? And so maybe they're just not used to it yet. Yeah, I think that's true. Uh, yeah, no, no, I, I, I think that is a, a real possibility. And you know, we're watching the evolution of, uh, of, of in both sectors. You know, governments that might be a little more aware of what foundations can bring to them, and foundations being more willing to do it, more willing to uh, put the the staff and the resources and the time into uh, this kind of policy collaboration, in particular. Yeah, and it, it's a huge difference in twenty years. You know, part of this has to do with the maturity of the field. And, and now I'm talking about the philanthropic field in Canada. You know, there's been a lot of maturing, but we have a long way to go. Uh, and again, part of the reason I wrote the book was to try and illustrate that evolution and to show that, you know, there is uh, some very positive direction that foundations can take. Uh, but they need to invest in themselves and they need to invest in their own capacity. I'm now making a pitch here for something I believe strongly, which is, you know, we need to build our own field. Foundations need to build our field of philanthropy. And we need to put the resources into that that will allow us to do that data sharing and policy uh, development work and uh, and influence and and convening that, you know, that, that, that we could do better than we're doing now. Maybe what I, I would just add is that there's such a fine line, you know, who are the foundation to advocate to any government? You know, it, when, when, if we believe that it is the community that knows better and it, it is the groups that know better. So I believe that we're, we're there to support their work, you know, and, and yes, very often we're able to open a door or amplify a voice like Artie said. But sometimes if we take a leadership, it might advance some issues like let's take the non-qualified donee example with the CRA. You know, PFC, Philanthropic Foundations Canada, really worked very hard at making this happen and advocated for it. I was in the hail personally, you know, meeting different people to make sure that we open. Uh, we're, it's, it's, it's possible easier to make uh, gifts and, and, and donations to uh, non-qualified donees. So sometimes finding the right place is, is not easy. Questioning how can we do it in, in in the way that is in synchronicity with what the sector or what the communities need is, is always a top of mind for me. Liliana and Artie, you, you, you've both been leaders in this field, but, and, and Hillary, you, you, you talk about some of the really innovative uh, examples. But even when we look at large foundations, there are what, over 5,000, um, quote, private foundations in Canada. Half of them don't even have websites. They, they're, not, they're not transparent. Um, and one might say they're quite conservative in the sense of following traditions that they, they've established, not very imaginative, my own assessment. But 
following what they give. How do we pull the rest of the, how do we pull more of the, of institutional philanthropy into being leaders in whatever way they, they, they choose into, into influencing? Um, part, of, part of my own concern is the sector doesn't do much of its own R&D. It doesn't um, do enough in terms of building professional skills of research of uh, ways that that help others come along. So how do we how do we expand that um, that engagement, that curiosity, that that courage? I think you're addressing that to the two leaders here. No, you too. You you raised it, Hillary. Uh, okay. <laughs> in that case, well, like, you know, you have to do it through example um, and, you know, through inspiration. I, I I do not think, by the way, that all foundations have to follow the same path. Um, and, you know, you mentioned the 5,000 private foundations plus, uh, you know, the close to 6,000, I think now. But, you know, many of these foundations are, in fact, uh, they're vehicles for donations made by individuals. You know, and I would not put a foundation of a couple of million dollar assets, you know, where uh, an individual is using that foundation as a as a way to issue checks. I would not put that in the same category at all as a McConnell or Definity. Uh, you know, so we're actually talking about a, a subset of foundations that, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, these are institutions that have strategies and missions and values and are and staff often, not all, but but. But most um, of the ones that I've talked about have staff, which I think is a necessary component. You need to build capacity. And it's that smaller subset of foundations that I think need to be inspired and need to be creative and, and need to be imaginative. You know, and I, and I think this is, again, part of the evolution we've seen in 20 years. There have been some foundations that have changed enormously in the last 20 years uh, and and are now serving as models for others. Every single one of the foundations that I write about in the book has a website, more than a website. They're all communicating actively. Many of them have annual reports, but they're also publishing uh, stories about what they're doing. They're they're sharing their evaluations. You know, this is all critical stuff. They, you have to think of yourself in a, as a foundation, as uh, as a, an organization. You know, you're not a, a person you're an organization that actually has a commitment to community and you have to think about what that means uh so i have a lot of hope for the the development of the foundation sector in canada i you know i i don't think you have to be a very big foundation to make a huge difference but you do have to be focused and you do have to have those elements that i talk about earlier the the sort of courage curiosity commitment uh because Otherwise, you know, you might as well just be handing out one or two checks a year to the local university and the local United Way. And I like the United Way. I think it should be supported. <laughs> Absolutely. In some cases. Yeah, be careful about what you say about Centraide. Um, maybe what I add uh, to that, I think l'exemplarité is, is what I, my vision of things, let's just do it, do it ourselves and share our learnings because we're making a lot of mistakes. And we are sharing them. And, and when we announced our 100% impact investment strategy, we said, we'll make the errors, that's for sure, but we'll share and others might also learn from those. Um, and, and reaching out. So I think uh, that collaboration and that's the other C I would add to the three C's of, of uh, Hillary. Um, it is so interesting because that's how we can share what we're doing. Uh, explore new avenues together and learn together. So the collaboration is, is really key for me as well. That's very true. And if I may, just one last thing is recognizing that we're part of an ecosystem. And in that ecosystem, you know, in, in, any, in any system, what one does impacts, impacts the other or has influence on, on the other, but everyone has the different role in, within an ecosystem and collectively then you achieve, um, you know, common outcomes that neither one could have achieved on their own. One of the questions um, in, in the Q&A is essentially, I'm paraphrasing, does it matter where the money comes from in terms of, of 
questions, which are questions that are increasingly being asked as the as the 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 impact of uh, on the inequality of how wealth was was made and 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 that process. Does it influence strategy in your experience and and with your own foundations and when you look around the sector as to the nature of the source of the wealth that established the foundation in the first place, which may then go to who's on the who's on the board. Uh, is it still the, the family or is it a, a broader a broader group? Any thoughts on that? Uh, well, I'll jump in, I guess. Um, you know, I, it, I'm not quite sure if uh, the question is about the nature of the wealth or about the uh, the commitment to accountability of the, the foundation today. You know, some foundations, yes, are still governed by family. Other foundations have moved beyond the original donor and, and beyond the original family. You know, take the example of a, a, a laid law foundation in Toronto. Uh, now a board that has, yes, I think a couple of laid laws still on that, but it's a board that's largely made up of uh, people who either are drawn from the community that the laid law foundation supports, so young people. Um, also, uh, to Artie's point, you know, a much more diverse uh, group of people, a very diverse staff uh, at laid law, uh, and full accountability. It, you know, they they are out there talking about what they're doing, how they're doing it. Uh, and they are, I think, uh, very open to to criticism or to, uh, you know, to positive uh, sort of reinforcement of some of the work that they're doing. They see themselves, as already says, as part of a, an ecosystem. Uh, you know, they are not apart from that ecosystem. Now, the, the money originally, uh, three generations ago, uh, came from... Uh, as many of the family foundations in Canada, uh, you know, it came from uh, people who invested in businesses, uh, whether the businesses were uh, trading businesses or financial businesses, or in some cases, uh, some of the uh, the original natural resource businesses of the country. You know, we are a country built on uh, the extraction of, of resources. Uh, and, you know, that... That, that that source of the capital, uh, you know, I think is not what dictates the nature, the identity, the commitment, the focus of the Laidlaw Foundation today. Uh, arguably, you know, young people, uh, you know, in Ontario, if, they, if the Laidlaw Foundation did not exist, the situation of young people in Ontario would be materially worse. Would you rather have a Laidlaw Foundation <laughs> or not? Uh, I I would say yes. Uh, let's let's by all means have a Laidlaw Foundation, but in its form, in its current form, which I think has evolved appropriately to meet the needs of today and to reflect the needs of the community that it's working with. As someone in the education business, uh, I'm going to ask the question of if you're looking to hire staff, particularly young staff, professionals in your organizations. What kind of skills, what kind of approaches, what do you value uh, in, the, in the, the staff that you will hire in your, uh, in your foundations? Or what should we be, be looking to? Any thoughts on that? Or how does one get in the door, perhaps more, or generally? So you know, at McConnell, in the last two years, I've been recruiting so many people that we went through that exercise uh, at different moments. So depending, there's so many various ways. Uh, one is sometimes we're looking for subject matter experts. You know, we need ex climate experts. We, we, so sometimes it's, it's around that. Very often, we're looking for people who have lived experience, bring different perspectives, a diversity of views which is really interesting. That makes meetings extremely colorful and, and in all sense of, of, of that word. And also what we're looking for is for people who are committed and passionate about what they want to do. So that they choose to come and work in this environment. 
Uh, I'll give the example of, you know, our investment team. They could go and work in a private bank doing investment and earn three times the salary that they are earning at McConnell. So you do have to come committed, engaged, and passionate about what you do. Great. And I, I you know, again, it, I agree with Liliana, it depends on the role. I mean, and I think some role requires expertise, but I think beyond expertise, and a lot of times when you hire, you know, one of the things I look for is an entrepreneurial spirit, um, someone that can come in and be able to um, think outside the box, be able to create new things. Uh, you know, courage, compassion, and curiosity are my three C's, actually. Um, and I always talk about that because the courage to lead, the compassion to be able to understand the community and, and be able to empathize with that, and the curiosity to be able to think through things, think outside the box, understand how things work or or why things happen and, and, and be able to be curious with other people as well. And so like character for me is always a bug. Like, I feel like I can teach a skill. You can easily teach a skill, but you can't teach character. Well said. We're down to our last couple of minutes. Do each of you have um, one takeaway that for others who are leading philanthropic strategies in, in existing or new foundations, or perhaps as individual philanthropists that um, you'd like to leave. Hillary, do you want to start? Yeah, um, well, I'd like to go back to uh, to something that I think both RD and Liliana mentioned, um, and it, it relates as well to the last question that uh, they were dealing with, you know, what kind of people work in foundations today? Who are we looking for? Uh, and it's this question of collaboration. Uh, you know, I think that it's true that very few funders, if any foundations, uh, can achieve real impact without collaboration. And that is a hard thing to do. And it, in some ways, it's counter to the organizational model, a foundation, the kind of foundation I'm talking about, uh, say a typical family or independent foundation, um, has a board and has uh, an endowment that it's managing and it has a set of grantees that it's working with. And most of the incentives uh, in the past have been not in favor of collaboration. They've been very much uh, incentives that drive a foundation to do its work on its own. Uh, we make our own decisions. We decide who we're going to give the money to. We're going to decide how our endowment is invested. You know, we're not sharing that with others. But in in all of this, if you don't collaborate, you are just simply not going to have the impact that you want to have. And I think any foundation that aspires to impact, and I would hope that most of the foundations, certainly the ones I've been writing about, but also I hope future foundations and a foundation like Definity, which is definitely going to be in the second edition of my book, <laughs> uh, that, you know, that will come out, that characteristic. So you need to hire people who have collaborative skills. You need to support a board in uh, understanding what the culture of collaboration means. Uh, you have to have leaders who are comfortable collaborating. And I think you need accountability around that too. Uh, you know, when you are collaborating with others, you need to be doing everything you can to be accountable to those collaborators and to expect them to be uh, accountable to you. It's a, it's a much harder job than it used to be. You know, so that simple job of, of being a charitable grant maker that so many foundations were, say, 20, 25 years ago, you know, it's a, it's a very different job today. Uh, and I think it's a more complex, more challenging, uh, but also much more potentially rewarding uh, role than, than that old kind of charity grant maker role was. So that's my last short, short to long <laughs> comment for you. Excellent. Artie, any advice? Yeah. You would and just, look, I agree with everything Hillary said. And just to jump off on that is would be the openness to learning. Um, you know, you're never going to be able to collaborate if it's your way or the highway. And uh, the other thing is really knowing, coming into the space, knowing that we don't know what we don't know. And there's so much we still need to learn. And, and being a part of a community that you can work with together and learn from together will only help 
everyone um, grow and create better impact. Wonderful. Liliana, last word to uh, you. I, want, I won't be original, and that's what I wanted to land on, which is collaboration. Uh, I would say I'm addicted to collaboration. And I, when I read the book of Hillary, I said, okay, we're in there and there and there. So, you know, sometimes it's a, an ad foundation that leads a collaboration, like uh, uh, the Clean Economy Fund that IV started, or sometimes with uh, the Youth Integrated uh, Services, uh, the AMHWAG, uh, which is the Bach Foundation that leads it. And sometimes you need to be in collaboration to shift power. Might it be with the Indigenous Peoples Resilience Fund, so the Northern Manitoba Food and Culture Community Collaborative. So sometimes you have different posture, different position with those, within those collaborations, but we cannot advance anything uh, if we're all there all by ourselves. So isolation is not the answer. Collaboration is the solution. Thank you. We are out of time. Thanks to all of you. I highly recommend. Uh, from charity to change. It's it's an easy read, uh, unlike what academics write. And uh, congratulations, Hillary, on on a on a book really well done. And and Thank thanks to much. Liliana and Artie for your leadership. And we hope to see you at a future event. Bye. Thank now. you. Wonderful to be on this panel with you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. Bonne soirée tout le monde.